Hello again. Hello, YouTube. I know there are a couple people from class might be listening today. And there's a bunch of random, random people. Thank you for listening to... I don't know. That's the case. Um, so, I did this start to give you a place where to start, at least? I started to give you a starting place. Do you want me to continue on with this? Would that be good? Or do you want me just to shut up? Okay. I've, I've got a very... Uh, absolutely. I will... And you're the closest, so I can see you right here. Yes. Oh, good. Thank you. <laughs> For those of you who don't want to hear this, you can just tune me out, put in the earphones. You know, I've got a, I've, I've got a daughter who's 11. I'm getting used to that. I mean, no, <laughs> I'm just kidding. But no, it's going to happen. I know this. Um, all the things I did as an adolescent are going to come back to haunt me. And... Okay. So we have, for all intents and purposes, with this syntax, an empty model right now. The problem comes in when we want to compare this model with the model that looks at uh, when we add predictors. And because of the way Levon works, every predictor we add to the model adds more covariances to it. So with me describing this, I'm going to go a little bit slower to kind of describe what's happening. If I were to go and let me find it here. There was some syntax. I just want to show you what happens here. There's a a function that I never ever use with, unless I'm teaching called fitted. Uh-oh. There we go. Fitted <laughs> used to be used to be sort of the, the idea. Fitted to me makes me think like that's like the past tense of a verb, like fit. My daughter used to be like when she was three. Oh, you know, you you it's what, what I was telling you about when I was fitting, when I was throwing a fit. <laughs> she could she call it fitting. So anyway, I think of that. I think of my my uh, my toddlers and they're uh, they're they're throwing temper tantrums with this when I see fitted. But this is telling us the covariance matrix in our model. And I mention this to you right now because this is why we need to add the zeros to the other variables. When we have a covariance matrix, uh, when when we go do a model comparison by likelihood ratio test, the same variables have to be in the model to make the comparison valid. Meaning. If we go to add our predictors in, and Levon starts making co puts puts them where we can see them on the covariances and mean side, that means they need to be there for both this model, the empty model, and models that come on later. So that's why we're doing this to make the likelihood ratio test valid. We can do this one quick test of all of our parameters all at once. So to do that, we need to remember what our names of our variables are. And we got to think about what the other predictors are. So if we go back to the homework, we wanted both, we wanted the instruction type predicting both DVs, but then we also wanted the experience and the interaction between them, right? So we have instruction type, in this case would be crepe class, experience, and the crepe class by experience interaction. So for each one of those regression lines under the means section, we can add that, each of those, with a plus separating them. Just like we would add it to the LM model statement when we were doing regression or ANOVA before. Right, just now we're adding more than one. So we want crepe class. We want experience. And again, these have to be spelled the same way in your syntax quote that they are in your file. Because Levon is going to go and look through the data for n names that are exactly that. Okay. So there's all three of them. I can copy them and I can paste them in. Now I have all three. And what Levon is going to do is estimate the regression coefficients for them. And that would not work for us in this empty model. We want the regression coefficients to be zero. Now logically, why is that the case? The empty model, whenever you have a re zero regression coefficient, it's like you don't have one there, right? So it's empty. So if you put them all at zero, it's, it should be relatively equivalent to the empty model. That's at least the, the way I'm going to sell it. So we just put a zero and a star by it. And that zero star by each of these names tells Levon, you know that regression equation that you can hypothetically pretend that needs to be in front of that predictor? That regression beta in all the formulae? Just make that equal to zero. 
One other thing I wanted to note before I go too much further, anything that starts with the pound or hash symbol right here in the green syntax is treated like a, a comment in the rest of R. So if you want to put notes to yourself, just make sure they start with a, that pound just like you would in comments in the rest of R. So any questions on what I just did? Yes. Uh, just instructions. So I can use pancake class. It won't change my log, like, my log likelihood, but it will change the direction of all of my effects. And because I built the homework, I had to build it in a way, I had to build it one way or the other. And because of that, my instructions say use crepe class instead of pancake. We're, we're, we're saying the instructions said, um, let pancake instruction be the reference group. That means anybody getting uh, instruction, pancakes get a zero. And so, sorry, where I'm going with the first part of my answer was, technically speaking, we could have picked crate class to be the reference group, right? right? And so I just had to pick one, um, but yes. So that's where I'm getting it from instructions, but that's also why I had to pick one. I, I'm not advanced enough as a programmer to be able to figure out how to make it so you could just tell the computer which one you use and then it just loads up a different set of results if you chose it one way or the other so I'm just not not there yet but someday hopefully <laughs> actually probably not I'm just let's just be honest at this point in my life I'm locked in I am who I am for better or for worse right no that's not true that is not true I've heard that though from people who reached my age they're like you know at some point you just like accept there's a certain sense of acceptance and I'm like no I don't really that's sort of a cop-out anyway um, anyway, sorry, I'm, I'm not good at programming. That's where I'm going with that. <laughs> I'm saying this to all of you because, let me tell you, the struggles you're having with R, I'm right there with you, but with different parts of R. And I'll share my experience with you a little bit later on, but in the last two days, I got R to do something that didn't take a lot, lot, lot of code, like line-wise, but I couldn't ever get it to do before. So I, I just, you know, if you want to share commiseries about R, I'm right there with you. I'm not going to judge you. I've been there. Uh, so just hang in there. So if, is everybody okay with how I did this? Other questions on this? Let's run it. So we rerun the syntax. When I put my cursor, when you see the blinking cursor on the line where the variable name is, and I hit Control or Command Return, it just skips down to the next line. So it does a big skip. All of that's in. I redo model one fit. I hit summary. And now you'll look at these estimates. They're not going to change a whole lot from where we were in the, the model before this. But what you're going to see differently is you're going to now see regressions above it, where you should see a bunch of zeros. The other thing you're going to see is now we have six degrees of freedom in our saturated mo in our model comparison between saturated and this model. And the reason there are six degrees of freedom there is because it's equal to the number of parameters we set equal to zero. Right? So the other thing I'm going to just show you, if I ask for the fitted model syntax, again, this is the covariance matrix that Levon thinks my data should be like, here's what it tells me. We have all five of my variables in it. How are we doing? It's pretty awesome, right? Not really? Eh. Questions on this? Yes? Can you go to the first part of the summary Yes. So we have right here? So maybe a bit lower. Lower. Ah, yeah, um, Levon has some weird way of truncating long variable names, and I don't know how it's doing it, but I've learned it's happened, I, I, for whatever reason, it sees how long it is, and then it just starts cutting out, I think, vowels, which makes makes things hard to read sometimes. Um, I, I don't know of a setting that can override it. I wish there were, uh, an, or maybe I should look for one, but hope that helps. Ooh, okay. 
Yeah, you should have the file. You should have a variable that's experience x crepe class. Uh, it's in. You should. And the way that you can tell if you go to the name, if you use names of data 01, or you look at data in your um, in your environment, if you go look at the data file, that name should be in there. And so there may be. Um, I'd go there and copy it from there to begin with. That's the other thing. The pro I like the long variable names because they help me remember what I did. The problem with it is it gets shortened by Levon, and then <laughs> the, the longer it is, the more easy it is for me to copy the wrong or to type it wrongly. I'm about six keystrokes away from my next typo, I think. I'm about where, how often do you typo? Do you anybody? Nobody want all the time. It's getting worse because I just use a lot of touchscreen devices. Oh, anyway. Okay, um, other questions on this? Is the light starting to come on a little bit? Kind of like there's a path, sort of? Okay, let's try model two. I feel like, I feel like making sure that your life isn't miserable this week with respect to this class. And if your life is miserable in other classes and you need someone to talk to, I'll listen. There are probably better other people than that too, but I try to make it so that I don't hurt you as much as I can. <laughs> Let's do model two. So what I did is I copied and pasted everything from model one syntax all the way down through fitted. All of it. Copied and pasted. And then everywhere where I saw model one, I changed the one to a two. So the model two dot syntax, <laughs> model two dot fit, and then in the SEM function should be model two dot syntax. In the summary statement, model two dot fit, and oh yeah, I need to change it in the fitted statement as well. Again, fitted isn't something you need for your homework. It's me trying to play the role of teacher here. How are we doing? So, let me ask you, what is different about model two from model one? Okay, so which variable of these three is instruction type? Crepe class. So for that variable, just get rid of the star and the zero. You get rid of the star and the zero, and you can rerun everything. All right, so the nice thing about Levon is that once you put in all the predictors you might have, the work to change the model goes pretty quick. The bad thing is it takes a lot to get to that spot, right? So I'm going to rerun model two sent or run model two syntax, run model two fit, take a look at my summary, and now what I should see is values for crepe class under both pancake rating and crepe rating. Right? I see people smiling. That's good. I like I like smiles. I also see people frowning. Hang in there if you're frowning. The uh, if you when when you get to model two and you look at the summary, you should find non-zero estimates for crepe class under both the pancake rating part and the crepe rating part of regressions. So this brings up another point. Let's interpret what these mean. This set of output under regressions is separated by a dependent variable, right? So like this is a miniature summary statement for that LM, the stuff we started class with, with regression and ANOVA. This is that for each variable separately, right? So this is the first one is pancake rating. This is the effect of crepe class on your pancake ratings, or at least my effect. Hopefully you see different numbers there for you. If not, then everybody gets my effect, and oh well, life goes on. Too late to change now. Um, this other rating right here is the, uh, the beta weight for crepe class for crepe rating. Now, these can be interpreted just like you interpreted your regression parameters from before. Remember, crepe class is a dummy coded or a group, a group variable. So those numbers in this statement represent the mean difference between people in the crepe class and people in the pancake class on their respective ratings, right? So if you think about that, this, this beta weight right here tells me 
if you were in the crepe rating, okay, sorry, if you were in the crepe class, when you made crepes, your rating was 3.3.3, uh, sorry, for me, 3.359 points higher than someone who was in the pancake class making crepes. Or another way of putting it, crepe class helps your crepe ratings, right? Maybe. This estimate says people in, who learned how to make crepes had pancake ratings on average that were less than the pancake. People in pancake, I'm sorry, people who were in the crepe class who made pancakes had ratings for their pancakes that were was 0.223 less than people in pancake class. So relatively speaking, uh, because this effect is not significant, taking crepe class, we learned from just this model, taking the crepe class means you did way better at crepes and it didn't really hurt you at making pancakes. Oh no, that's a dig at pancakes. I will tell you, any, any food you can have a three-year-old help you make, probably not gourmet, right? <laughs> My son does not, he's pretty um, argumentative in the morning. He doesn't wanna, he doesn't wanna do anything that, well, anything at all. And it's usually exacerbated because he's usually starving, so he's hangry, all right? Angry and hungry, right? And, uh, and so it's like, you want to eat? No, I'll give you cake, whatever, eat. No. All right, how about you help me make pancakes? Oh, yeah, I'll do that. Then he eats pancakes, right? Okay, it's a trick. Aisha, yes. Oh, I'm sorry, waiting for, sorry. Any questions about my son and him making pancakes? We do use food coloring. Uh, I have not taken either class, so my ratings would probably be that. But do you see the difference? So the, the interesting thing, why I want to tell you about this and why I'm teaching you this is the interesting thing about a linear model can help you, or a multivariate linear model can help you answer that question a little bit, right? We collected ratings about how you make pancakes and ratings about how you make crepes from people, and we randomly assigned them to different classes. And because we collected both of those, we learned that, hey, you need, you need some instruction to make better crepes, but maybe pancake instruction doesn't help you make better pancakes, right? Kind of a more complex hypothesis than just looking at each separately. Does that make sense? Maybe. I'm trying to like give you the, the like the research reason for it. Why? It's a silly example. It doesn't apply to anything in research, really. Maybe there's some experimental design. I don't know. But um, there are some really cool questions you can start asking each other about this. Like for instance, here this is going to help you later on. I'm gonna I'm gonna stop here for a second by making models, but I want to show you something. If you wanted to actually. Let me show you the model, the, the fitted matrix for this. Can I show you the, the covariance matrix? Again, this covariance matrix now, you remember there was a bunch of zeros in all these spots before? And now those zeros are replaced with actual numbers. And those numbers are there because we had values for crepe class predicting pancake rating and crepe rating. Okay, that, we, we, we knew that was there, but where are these numbers over here coming from? Experience versus crepe rating, uh, a pancake rating, experience versus crepe rating. What, where, where is that coming from? Anybody want to guess? Yeah, Ryan. In a way, yes. It's this way. Uh, so we knew before, we can see over here, that people, that we knew, we, we put in a direct effect of crepe class on each of these ratings, right? So here is our direct effect of crepe class on pancakes and crepe class on crepes. This other part, why does experience show up? Well, it turns out experience relates to crepe class at 0.77. And so because experience and crepe class are related, and because now crepe class and ratings are related, there's an indirect effect of experience through crepes class on ratings. So that's why the numbers start to change. Is that, so yes, what you were saying I think is technically right, but with a roundabout way of being so. Does that help? Interesting, at least a little bit? 
what I'm trying to show is that each of the variables you put in are, are when they're part of the model, they're all starting to be related to each other. So even things that you don't realize that are happening might be happening. So it takes a little bit more under, looking at output to, to, to work with this. Here, let's, uh, let me ask another question. If I wanted to take the difference between the rating, uh, the effect of crepe class on pancakes versus the effect of crepe class on crepes, I can't do that directly with my output, right? I can see it, I can calculate it, I can say here's the difference, crepe minus pancake is, you know, crepes are bigger, but we can calculate it in Levon too. And the reason why I'm mentioning this is because some of the questions in your homework are going to ask you to take those betas and combine them in ways that you need to use them. Like we did with GLHT. Do you remember the GLHT function in our earlier homeworks where we had to go and have we had a matrix that had a bunch of zeros in and we had to figure out the ones for each of the betas? This is where Levon gets a little bit easier. So if you wanted to take the difference between the, rate, the crepe class effect for crepe rating minus, I think it, hang on, I have pancakes minus crepe, there it goes. If I want to take the pancake rating minus the crepe rating, I'd have to go and get those betas to do so. The way we do that in Levon is through the use of what we call a label. So a label, if you put an open and close parenthesis in front of the effect with a star, in that parenthesis, in those parentheses, you can put the label that <coughs> describes a beta that you want to use later on. All right, so instead of using GLHT and figuring out which ones and zeros, you start by saying, I want the beta that goes with this effect right here. And you put a label in front of it. So I'm going to call this beta um, C for P <laughs> crepes for pancakes, pancake rating. <laughs> All right, it's crepe class. This is the beta weight for people making uh, in crepe class for making pancakes. I, I, I'm running out of labels. It's not. It's it's all. It all has to be one character string. And if it gets too long, Levon will truncate it. By the way, if it gets too long in M plus, it just won't work. It'll crash. It'll break the model. You get like nine characters in M plus. You got to be really creative. I'll bet most of you don't remember the time when computers didn't let your file names be longer than like eight characters. Do you remember that? Oh my goodness. Okay, at least a couple of you do. Uh-huh. Yeah, like back before, like, uh, anyway, yes. So now I can do the same thing for this other value right here. I could call this crepe rating for crepe. Oh, uh, sorry, crepe beta crepe class for crepe rating. All right, so I named a different value there. So you see that? By putting the label in, I'm not changing anything with respect to my analysis so long as the labels have different text strings in them. Follow? So now I can create new, or I can create, um, we call them new parameters. I can create the test. I can take the, beta, the difference in betas. We knew before what I want is diff p minus Pancakes minus crepes, that difference. I just create another name for a variable. I put a, an equal and a, or a, what is it, colon equals, is it? Yeah, sorry, I always get them backwards. Colon equals. When you put colon equals in, this says, I'm creating a brand new thing that I want you to give me in the output. And you just take the labels and do the math with them. I'm going to take the pancake rating, the beta for that, and subtract the crepe rating, the beta for that. So that output will now contain a brand new parameter that's formed by taking the difference between the two that you have up in the syntax. That's the version, of, that's how Levon does GLHT for comparing things. Any questions on what I just did to describe this? It's a little bit foreign, but I think it's way direct. Like compared to GLHT, remember figuring out which beta you had? I think this is pretty quick to go and grab those betas. Anybody with me? Questions? No? Okay. I talk quick. I try to slow down to do that. That's why I sort of tell anecdotes jokes and, tell, and bad jokes also. Anecdotes, anecdotes and bad jokes. Can't speak anymore. 
So now, once you go and look at your output, everything else should be the same about your model, but at the very bottom, you should see the estimate of that effect. What do we have here? We took negative 0.223 and subtracted 3.359 from it, which should give us negative 0.3582. And that is our difference between the crepe effect for pancakes versus crepes. But the cool thing about this is, remember, we could have done that by hand with a calculator. What we couldn't have done by hand was figure out the standard error or the p-value that would go with it. And that's what the, the next thing it does automatically for us. So it automatically builds that in for us. We don't have to run any other steps with it. We just run one analysis, ask for one set of output, and get a bunch of new parameters. Questions? Mm -hmm. Pardon me. Uh, yes. Should I go through it again, Amy? Okay. Just wanted to see it. Yeah. Thank you. Yes. Jacinda or <laughs> Justin. Sorry. Jacinda. Sorry. I should say just say your name. <laughs> Mm -hmm. So I'm getting the right log likelihood and the right estimate effects, but I the degrees of freedom I, I'm getting seven in the likelihood the test statistic I'm getting incorrect and hmm. and um, I just talked to someone who's well getting ah so take a look at my degree. you're looking at so if you're getting seven degrees of freedom it's most likely because you're looking at this model test baseline model. So the model test baseline model, um, just get in the habit of ignoring that. It's pretty much worthless information. Where those seven degrees of freedom from come from, if we look, go and look at our fitted covariance matrix right here, there are seven covariances that are not along the diagonal. And so what that baseline model it's comparing, it is comparing the model where you, it sets all the covariances between the variables equal to zero versus the saturated model where they're all estimated. So each variance gets estimated, each mean gets estimated, but all the covariances are not estimated in the baseline model that it's referring to. And so that's where those seven degrees of freedom come from. Now, why would you want to compare a model with zero covariances to model with all the covariances? What is the like? What is the hypothesis you're testing by doing that? Let me ask you that. Maybe not you or anybody that. You're welcome to answer to it. <laughs> I feel like I'm not. No, no, no. Don't you can't answer this. But so anyway, sorry, my words come out badly. If the in the test in that baseline model test, what it's comparing is a model that has every covariance set to zero versus a model where it's estimating every covariance. Everything else is the same. All the variances in both of the models are estimated, all the means are estimated. What's the hypothesis you're testing with that model comparison? What's that? No, there are no predictors in those models. Go with the constraint to find the hypothesis. The constraint is all the covariances are equal to zero. A covariance equal to zero means a correlation is equal to zero. So it's testing whether or not you have any correlations not equal to zero in your analysis. Or better yet, the null hypothesis, all correlations equal zero. The alternative hypothesis is at least one correlation is not equal to zero. Now, who would care about a test like that? Have you ever talked to anyone and been like, hey, wait, before you start anything, do you have at least one correlation that's not zero? <laughs> that's what basically this is saying. So, why, so the seven's coming from that, but I just want to do a little explaining why that is. The model test baseline model is virtually a worthless test. The only time we ever care about it, that I've ever even seen it considered, is when you've tried a bunch of analyses and you can get no significant like betas or anything like that. Oh, nothing's working, nothing is working, nothing is working. And finally it says, 
are anything is anything correlated in your model? Because without a correlation that's significant, you won't find a beta that's significant usually. That's not exactly the case. There's variances that go into it and so forth. I actually was getting the seven from underneath log Ah, and that's the number of free parameters in your analysis. So that comes from if you go and look up the numbers in your output, the ones that are not, are listed. There will be seven numbers that are listed. There's two variances, two intercepts, one covariance, one crepe rating effect here for crepe class, and one uh, crepe class rating effect for pancake rate. So there's the seven. So those are the seven parameters you have in your model. But if you're doing a model comparison, a likelihood ratio test is going to take the difference in number of parameters to give you the degrees of freedom for it. So this model had seven. The, the uh, empty model, or the model that we ran first, if I go back to it, this model had five. Right? So the difference in number of parameters is two. Now I will say, that's, I'm glad that you asked this question for a number of reasons, because I can. it gives me lots of teachable moments and makes me feel like I have relevance. Uh, not that it really matters, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> model one fit. If you take, if you want to do the likelihood ratio test between the two models, all right? So we could do the ANOVA function. Put the first model in. Put the second model in. Doesn't matter which direction you put them in. Oh no, nope, that didn't work. I need to do the whole model. This thing right here. Now what you should see here, the degrees of freedom difference is the number that should be in that go into the output for it. So this tells us. This is our hypothesis test of whether the, either one of those betas that we released to be estimated are. That's, what I was that's yeah. it. Mm -hmm. I see it in I know. <laughs> and I, that's actually the nice. It's 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 it, even though it's frustrating because you're like I want this to be like SAS. One of the good things about that is like having the knowledge of SAS at least brings a lot to wanting to see what's there. But I just want to walk through what it is. So thank you for asking the question. Did I answer? Are you okay? With any other questions? Did I bring up a question? Ryan has a question. Yes. Um, so when you run uh, the summary function, then and, uh, uh, you have to do the maximum function test statistics, is that basically looking your model versus the saturated. That's exactly it. And then so the ANOVA function is just looking at the nested model before to see if it fits better. That's right. That's right. So this this very Ryan's question was about this 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 very first part of the output that comes up. This is uh, when Levon takes your does your analysis is actually running three models. It's running your model, it's running the saturated model, and it's running the baseline model. This is the the ano like what the ANOVA function would be if you had run the uh, the saturated model. Um, so there, leave it there. Okay, other parts I wanted to ask, I wanted to talk to you about. I don't believe this is part of homework. I just want to sprinkle this in a little bit. The labels that you put in to name your betas are really cool to me. Right, and they're really cool, but they're also really powerful, and they can really screw you up. So, for instance, if I go through, and maybe I just was just not paying attention, and I just put the same label for both of these, B and B, what do you think it does? It does. It estimates. It constrains those parameters to be equal. Part, yeah, it is effectively an average. It depends on. It's a little bit more complicated because it depends on if the uh, if the uh, any missing data that might be there. But if you have the same amount of data and in this case same number of people in each group, it should be roughly the average. Although this is not the average. Yeah, never mind what I just said. Depends on other things. <laughs> Leave it at that. Uh, for some parameters, it can be the average. Why I mention that is if you're getting the wrong answers, just make sure your labels. Are different. Now, can anyone think of a reason why we might want to put these to be equal? You're assuming that they're, they're highly correlated. 
This model where they're equal assumes the effect of Krebs class is the same on both dependent variables. That's a hypothesis that we actually just tested by looking at the difference in the two betas. But you could test that same hypothesis using a likelihood ratio test. We could estimate a model where they're the same. We could estimate a model where they're separate. We could do a likelihood ratio test and we can test that effect, right? So one of the things that you're going to see in this whole crazy multivariate world of analysis is that you start seeing people estimate models where things are set to be equal quite often to, set, to test certain hypotheses, but not for our homework here. That's, yeah, here, you want me to do it real quick? Let's make a model three here. This is model two. I'll, make, I'll let model two be different. So I have an A and a B. I have a different label for them. And if I go, whoops, wrong, wrong direction, copy all this, paste it in, make a model three. And I'll take A and make the same label there. Change this to model three, not B template. Come on now. Model three, get rid of fitted. And I want to compare model two and three. I can just do that. I run everything. How many degrees of freedom in, are, in the, are going to be in this test? There'll be one, right? And the reason is because when we set them equal, we're estimating one less parameter than we set them to be free, to be estimated. So here is the test. Here's one degree of freedom. It tells us it's significant, which means... Uh, the null hypothesis is the constraint is that both of those betas are equal to each other. The alternative is they're not equal. And when we see a p-value small like this, we reject the null hypothesis. We say, hey, evidence does not suggest they are equal. So it's another way of thinking crazy about data. But the cool thing is this enables you to do a lot of those types of questions. Hey, is it the same effect for both of those? Let's find out. Now... I'll just leave it there. There may be a little bit more to consider, but that's just it's part of how it works. Other thoughts or questions on this? Shall I uh, stop here and let you have some homework time? Yeah, uh, on the syntax? It has to be a new parameter in the model. If I wanted to, like if I had done the, what I did before, this, I had a pancake rating, this here for crepe rating. This subtraction right there that I did before is a test to see there if they're equal. Because if that difference is zero, it's the, it's the same thing, right? Um, I can't do that when I constrain them to be equal because I'd subtract b from b and then that would be equal to zero. they probably something that would go wrong in the computer knowing r. Do you want to see what I was struggling with uh, with r? Or nah? Should I dare show you that? No, don't bother? Okay. If you are interested, why I'm saying this to you is because I've been in your, you may not believe me, you may not believe me, but I've been in your shoes before and I've fought with r for hours on homeworks or on research projects or whatever else. And finally, the part where it gets good. And you can get there, too, is what I want to say. If I can do it, heck yes, you can do it. Because you're way smarter than this guy. <laughs> Tell you that much. All right? But if you want to see something cool in R, just come up and I'll show you. It's got matrix algebra. Anybody? No? Can someone say Cholesky? No. All right. Nobody wants to hear it. I'll stop. Question? Yeah, real question. What's that? Oh, okay. Yeah, we, I was just going to stop talking and then everybody can work on things or however they want or leave or whatever. Cool? All right. Thanks, everybody. I'll stop the recording and we'll go from here. Thanks.